Hello, and welcome to my series on the works of David Lynch. This series will discuss all of Lynch's major original works in terms of their political, philosophical, and meta themes, focusing on postmodern theory, feminist themes, cultural critique, and media critique in his art. This video in the series will discuss Twin Peaks, including spoilers for the original series of Twin Peaks, and will assume anyone watching has already seen the series prior to engaging with this video. If any of the ideas in this video seem somewhat confusing, it might be worthwhile to watch the introduction video to this series in order to understand some of the history and theory going into this discussion. I would also like to mention that I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to support this channel and future videos like this one, the link is in the description. Thank you, and enjoy. Twin Peaks is somewhat of the centerpiece of Lynch's career. While Blue Velvet and Mulholland Drive are considered modern-day masterpieces of cinema, and Eraserhead, Lost Highway, and Wild at Heart have their own cult followings, it's Twin Peaks that ultimately seems to have stuck as David Lynch's primary contribution to pop culture. Which is funny, because it's one of the projects he had the least involvement in, and one that he seems to be less proud of. Twin Peaks was Lynch's first foray into television, and this is important to understanding the show as it is. I want to emphasize that phrase. The show as it is, because a lot of people mistakenly attribute Twin Peaks to Lynch alone. Whereas with a film like Eraserhead, where Lynch guided most of the process of production, or Blue Velvet, where Lynch has sole director and writer credit and was given final cut and an unsupervised production, Twin Peaks was a work in which Lynch had to contend with a medium that very much did not at the time allow for such freedom. You see, television isn't like film, at least not when Twin Peaks was being made. David Lynch and Mark Frost co-created the original concept of Twin Peaks, and they were involved in some of the writing and some of the directing and production, but TV is designed to produce a lot more content in a lot shorter amount of time. As such, Twin Peaks is a much more collaborative work than the previous two works featured in this series. As well, Twin Peaks was interfered with by producers and audience. This is by necessity. TV shows have a different relationship with their audience than the art house circuit. If a film isn't intended to have sequels, then the film is allowed to make its artistic points in one go. You don't come out of a film like Blue Velvet and demand that in the next movie we get to see Jeffrey take on some other criminal ring in a small town. We just get the one movie, the one story, and it's not ongoing. Twin Peaks was not made to end the way Blue Velvet ends. It was made to go on for a while. As such, as viewers are watching, the showrunners and producers can gauge what people like about the show or dislike it and modify it accordingly. They can meddle to create the ideal experience. As we all know, Twin Peaks was not the ideal experience the producers wanted it to be. There's a reason for that. Lynch's ambitions as a filmmaker wasn't necessarily out of line with the medium of television as it could be, but was definitely out of line with the medium as it was. His version of Twin Peaks wouldn't have gone the way it did, because his version would have gone off his own vision as one would in the art house circuit. Simply put, he tried to put an art house sensibility to a medium that was constructed to support committee think, a method of organizing art that is completely at odds with art house sensibilities. Twin Peaks represents, then, somewhat of a loss of potential. The return, which we'll get to at the end of this series, is more in line with what Lynch would hope to have done with television if given the chance. Twin Peaks had a lot of promise as a series, and Lynch's contributions absolutely injected a much-needed art house sensibility to a medium that was constantly in tension with Lynch's ideas. I don't think that producers killed Twin Peaks. I don't think the audience did. I think the medium of television was incompatible with what Lynch wanted to do with Twin Peaks. This is why, all things considered, Twin Peaks represents both the best and the worst aspects of television as a medium of artistic expression. And this is also why I tend to find Fire Walk With Me and The Return much more fulfilling than the original series, even with its consistent enjoyability. So if I discuss Twin Peaks as the centerpiece of Lynch's career, it's going to be tough. Because how much of it can I attribute to Lynch, and how much should I attribute instead to the rest of the people involved in the making of the show? Well, I'm going to talk about Lynch's role in the project, but I want to talk about Twin Peaks as it is. Because Twin Peaks isn't just the hypothetical version that fans have constructed in which Lynch had full control. It is what it is, and I'm going to review it along those lines. I want to emphasize the aspects that Lynch brought to it, but I won't disregard the other elements at play. The show is not purely Lynch's vision alone, but there still is a distinct artistic statement that the show, as it is, is saying. Twin Peaks is a very cryptic show, and part of that is because of the competing visions of the people working on the show, and part of it is because Lynch's contributions were very surreal, and often felt completely out of place with the rest of the show. The show felt deep, it felt like it must have been building to something. But it never really did, and got cancelled before it ever got somewhere. 
This left viewers wanting more, and for decades they tried to find more. In Twin Peaks, in Fire Walk With Me, in the books written by Mark Frost, they wanted to solve the strange, cryptic, almost occult mysteries of the show. They wanted it to make sense. What a lot of Twin Peaks fans didn't realize is that it already made sense. It always made sense, but it's not a puzzle to be assembled properly, a mystery to be solved, a meaning to decode, a secret message to locate. It's a soap opera with an art house director throwing in some weirdness because it gave the show a sense of gravitas and excitement. It's really not much more than that on its base level. But the thing is, that can actually warrant a lot of depth, a lot of discussion to be had. It's just, it's not some other thing beyond being a soap opera with weird elements. It's not an ARG. There's no trail of breadcrumbs here. If you spend all your time looking for patterns that aren't there, you won't begin to see what actually is there, which is a wonderful story about a heartbreaking murder in a small town. But I am going to make the case, despite myself, that there is a lot to find in the show. It's not hidden in background clues, it's just right there on the surface. It just requires knowing the right context and looking at the show from the right angle, which in my opinion requires understanding a bit of postmodernism and a bit about how art house productions differ from TV production. I do think that the show has metaphors, it has meanings beyond just its literal plot, but it's important to look at the meaning of Twin Peaks as part of a broader culture of television and film surrounding it, and it's also important to look at the meaning of Twin Peaks as a narrative. A lot of the stranger elements of the show are more tonal and relate more to the experiences of the characters. There are also meta-themes to be found, but the narrative centers on the here and now of the show, and the strange elements tie into the here and now first and foremost. I absolutely encourage alternative interpretations of the show, don't get me wrong, but I'm going to be arguing for my interpretation in this video because, well, it's my video and it's my interpretation. I'll be pulling from production history information that I have about the show, the broader context of Lynch's career, my own knowledge of US history, a bit of my knowledge on postmodern theory, and the show itself. I hope it'll be a well-substantiated interpretation, but it's still just what I get out of the show, and you're free to get what you want out of it. So let's dive into the world of Twin Peaks, shall we? Twin Peaks is the story of how Laura Palmer, a beloved young girl in a small town, was found brutally murdered, most likely by someone in the town. Her death exposes to the town and to the viewer the value of her life and the complicated way in which it was lived. Laura Palmer had a bright and dark side to her, and this tension between the good and bad side of Laura seems to have, on some level, split the town's own dual nature wide open upon her death. It's only through the loss of such a tragic figure that the town's great issues can be exposed. The investigation into Laura's murder reveals not necessarily a single culprit responsible for her death, but instead a myriad of social circumstances that allowed her life to be lived in pain, misery, and violence. The question, who killed Laura Palmer, was never meant to be answered because the answer was already present in the very title, Twin Peaks. It was the town of Twin Peaks that killed Laura Palmer because everyone in their own little way shares some responsibility for the way in which her life continued to be plagued by suffering and serious neglect from loved ones until it eventually culminated in the ending of her life. The show comments on the medium of television in the process and shares a semi-conscious relationship with its own production, as spiritual and surrealist elements play with the meta of the show by engaging with two new concepts for Lynch's work that would be further explored in Fire Walk With Me and throughout Lynch's later career, potential realities and competing narratives. I'll discuss these two concepts as they come, but let me just start by saying what they refer to. Potential realities is my phrasing to describe one of the ways in which Lynch uses surrealism. This is often referred to as dream logic by viewers, and the tendency is to view Lynch's later career as having dream narrative and reality. I think this misses the point of Lynch, because rather than focusing so much on whether or not one thing is real or another is unreal, Lynch seems to be more interested in exploring the potential of different narratives, different states of reality and different states of being. This is partially motivated by what appears to be Lynch's philosophy, which borrows a bit from existentialism. We'll discuss existentialism more in a later section, but for now I want to say that Lynch seems to look at life as fragile and small, and the universe as vast and incomprehensible. Because the universe can put us in any direction at any time, Lynch tends to have narratives that reflect less a single, unified sense of time and space, and instead several alternate ways in which events can transpire. It's not multiverse stuff, just engaging with reality as containing all sorts of different potential outcomes, and exploring those in fiction using surrealism. Lynch is willing to explore the what-if of stories he's writing, and this guides his style towards being rather abstract and surreal at times. 
So the meta angle is, in my opinion, Lynch playing around with the potential realities that a show like Twin Peaks can manifest. If you were to see two versions of the show, one in which Lynch had no control and one in which he had all of the control, then these would be two potential realities of Twin Peaks. This notion is, in my opinion, addressed in the actual show itself through the usage of surrealist elements. As for competing narratives, this is an extension of potential realities and brings an explicitly postmodern angle to it. Not only are different stories and narratives within a work of fiction potential realities, but they can exist in conflict, contrast, and even competition with one another. I'll use the phrase competing narratives to refer to instances when there is a tension between different narratives within one of Lynch's works. For example, skipping ahead to Mulholland Drive, it's well known that Mulholland Drive involves Naomi Watts and Laura Elena Herring playing different roles within two seemingly separate stories in the film. The film doesn't explicitly acknowledge that these are two different stories, and it's only through the renaming of the characters that we come to think of the two sections of the film as different stories. The shift in narrative presents a conflict between these two narratives as different characters, inhabited by the same actors, can imply what about what these two narratives have in common and what they don't. This is an example of two competing narratives, because the two don't logically follow from one another, but instead deliberately conflict with one another to highlight something about their differences and similarities. The phrasing I use, competing narratives, distinguishes itself from the dualism that people attribute to Lynch. Certainly, I do think there's an element of dualism in Lynch's works, but I think that it need not always be the contrast between light and dark, good and evil, or other binaries. Postmodernism, in part, is about breaking down binaries, and I do think Lynch is disinterested in the notion of a binary, and instead approaches meaning from the angle of the tension between different forms of potential. The good and evil aspects of Twin Peaks are differing narratives about how the town is understood by its people and by the show's audience. Mulholland Drive, for example, has differing narratives between Betty and Diane, but neither is necessarily good or evil, hence why I distinguish this concept from dualism. Dualism applies in the case of Twin Peaks or Blue Velvet, but not in everything Lynch does. Finally, Twin Peaks continues in the tradition set by Blue Velvet and Eraserhead by commenting on patriarchal gender relations and the exploitation of women by men. Twin Peaks also follows from Blue Velvet by highlighting the nostalgia that 1980s culture had for the culture of the 1950s, and specifically critiques the tendency to glorify the small town iconography present in the trope of the bygone era. Twin Peaks also contributes to these previously established themes by expanding them into more themes of classism and capitalist exploitation, and explores these themes in a television context to further acknowledge the issues of television as a medium, both sociologically and, on some level, spiritually. With that out of the way, we can discuss these themes in more explicit Who killed Laura Palmer? It's a question that seemed to have reverberated through television for decades, as the marketing campaign for Twin Peaks, coupled with a very memorable pilot episode, led a very large number of people to want to know more about the life, death, and aftermath of Laura Palmer. Laura's death was what incited the story of Twin Peaks. It's what gave us a portal into its world, into its mysteries and eccentricities, into its citizens and their lives, into the otherworldly. Laura's death was integral to everything the show was about. So then the question that we need to ask in order to understand Twin Peaks is, why? Why is it all about Laura? Why does Laura matter? And while Fire Walk With Me will help answer those particular questions, the question that is most important to understanding the show is, why does Laura's murder matter? The most basic answer is because her death sparks a mystery into who killed her. But I think people misunderstand the mystery here. The goal, as far as I can tell from watching the show, is not to generate a mystery about her death, but about her life. If who killed Laura Palmer matters, we need to ask who was Laura Palmer. Laura Palmer, as a character, is meant to be a contradiction. She's the beloved small-town homecoming queen, a girl who everybody loved and everybody admired. She was America's sweetheart, but she was also a drug addict, underage prostitute who seemed to have love affairs with most men in the town, and later we find out that she was inadvertently an accomplice to murder, which, yeah, that part was a bit weird. She encompasses both sides of America in one person. As I'll discuss in the next section, American culture is marked by a sort of two-faced dynamic that also applies to the town of Twin Peaks itself. Laura Palmer is the ultimate contradiction manifested in a single girl that reflects the two worlds around her, one that cherishes traditionalism, idealism, and the American dream, and one that exploits people, resources, and money for various forms of material gain. 
Laura was never a bad person, but she was caught between two worlds. She was the most tense point in the tension between two versions of her local and national way of life. Laura deliberately exists in the show as an enigma, and this helps spark the mystery. Before we finally know who actually killed Laura, we have reason to believe it to be many people. By the time Laura is actually killed on screen in Fire Walk With Me, we've learned enough about her life to know that several people in the town would have serious motive to kill her. If the show hadn't forced the killer's reveal early into season 2, then we might have had a great deal more reason to suspect a number of other potential culprits as we learned more and more information about how she lived her life. See, part of what makes the mystery so powerful is what it reveals about even the people who didn't kill her. Dr. Jacoby was having what seemed to be a love affair with Laura and would have motive to cover it up. Bobby was a jealous boyfriend involved in a drug ring and probably fueling Laura's cocaine addiction, giving him proper motive if he found out about her life as a prostitute. Ben was the one trafficking teenage sex workers and, as is made explicit in the return, underage girls, and Laura knew about it and could put him in serious trouble if she spilled any of Ben's secrets. Ben also probably slept with Laura himself. Her place in the dark side of the town shows the dark side of many others in her life. Imagine it, if just about anyone in your local town, people who know you and claim to love you, your entire network of human beings to connect with, all have potential motive to brutally murder you, this alone says so much about the people in this town. Twin Peaks and its citizens would have to be deeply unwell that there are serious reasons to suspect many prominent figures of the town of violent murder. We'll discuss this more in a later section, but I want to also point out that the murder of Laura Palmer and the many potential suspects, all of this is also motivated by misogyny. It wasn't Ben who was brutally murdered, or Bobby, or Leo, even though they're all guilty of worse things than Laura and were all involved in the same circles of depravity that led to Laura's downfall and death. Most of the people who were suspects in Laura's murder were men who had either romantic or sexual ties to her and motives to cover up an underground drug ring that she could expose. She had to bear the brunt of every one of their misdeeds, even if only one person killed her. Any of their motives against her would have to be partially fueled by her womanhood, her being an object of desire for them. She was, for all intents and purposes, an object to the many people who saw her dark side. It was Donna, James, Harold who saw good in her, saw her as more than just an object for desire. So before we can move on to deeper discussion of themes, I want to discuss what is probably the most iconic scene in Twin Peaks, and probably one of the more iconic scenes in TV history, the discovery of Laura's body. This scene is so well done that it's almost upsetting. The scene itself is really affecting, and even watching it now, I still feel this strong sense of heartbreak as I watch it. The scene is punctuated by a few great elements. First, there's the fact that the body is seen on the shore in the distance before Pete discovers it, allowing the viewer to notice it first, which in my opinion adds to how disturbing her death is. Second, there's Pete's iconic line, she's dead wrapped in plastic. It's just an iconic line. Then there's the fact that Lucy is very business as usual because she doesn't yet know what's going on. This really helps intensify the heartbreak of the scene because Lynch isn't building up the drama of the discovery of Laura's death, he's downplaying it to give it a sense of grounded realism. They wouldn't yet know that some horrible tragedy has occurred and that just makes it feel more real when they finally discover that it was Laura. A quick aside, and this will sound kind of silly, but one of my favorite TV shows is, no joke, 21 Jump Street. You know, the old one with Johnny Depp and Peter DeLuise? I absolutely love it. But it's kind of garbage. 21 Jump Street isn't a soap opera by any means, but it was a primetime show that carried with it all the trappings of being basically propaganda for all sorts of things. The 1980s was big on moral panics and trying to take a strong moral stance on a topic. 21 Jump Street would have episodes about the AIDS crisis or about interracial relationships, about abortion, child trafficking, and so on. The show is rather conservative in many ways and mildly progressive at least a couple of times. The reason I bring up 21 Jump Street is because it captures a particular aesthetic, tone, and framing that Twin Peaks has in commonality with it. Shows of the late 80s and early 90s were very Republican and also very sappy, very melodramatic, very preachy, very dry. You would have shows where people attempt suicide, followed by bad racist comedy, followed by, I kid you not, the I have a dream speech laid over the credits. That actually happened in 21 Jump Street. The death scene of Laura Palmer feels very much like a TV show, with that dry, cold detachment that one can only get if they experience a show like this on a VHS tape late at night, sitting in the dark alone. It's simultaneously empty, yet a bit cozy. 
This bit where Truman is hearing Lucy being her usual old self has a rather dry, dark tone, punctuated by very mild comedy and sharing the visual style of typical TV shows like police procedurals in the vein of 21 Jump Street, makes it feel like any other TV show, but with this added feeling of emptiness. That intangible feeling of emptiness is key to the power of this scene and the pilot as a whole. See, a much worse TV show would begin with either A, some small story in which Laura is still alive so that she can be humanized, leading to the shock and heartbreak that happens as a result of her murder, or B, a perpetrator with a gun and a black glove on, shooting Laura to immediately spark the intrigue of the mystery. Twin Peaks very slowly builds up to the revelation of Laura's death and her murder, but makes a careful choice to not actually show us Laura's life beforehand. This means that, until the reveal of her death, Every character is only going about their day as usual. This is brilliant for a few reasons. First is the fact that it makes the mystery all the more interesting. If Laura is already dead, then we start with almost no information to go off of, which leaves an endless window of opportunity for the mystery to blossom. Second is the fact that it makes the scene all the more heartbreaking. This girl, who we've never even met, is already dead. There's also a sort of spiritual element of despair that occurs in this scene generally, as the feeling of just another day in Twin Peaks is punctuated by Angelo Badalamenti's score that creates this feeling of something v being very deeply wrong. The tragedy has already happened. This is the morning after the tragedy, and before we even see who it was, we already feel the heartbreak, we already feel the tragedy. It's like there's something in the air this morning, things are different, before we even know why they're different. Laura's death already, before revealed, creates a feeling of absence in her world, a feeling of loss. Third, and this is going to be important later, it suggests the full dehumanization of Laura Palmer. Until they flip her over to reveal it's her, this body is little more than an object. Laura Palmer has been fully dehumanized, the tragic victim of an extreme act of misogyny. Another element of the scene that I think helps make the scene work so well is that Andy begins crying when taking pictures of Laura's body. He doesn't know yet who it even is. It might not even be someone from town. He has no reason to assume he knows her, but he cries anyway. Part of this is because Andy's a bit of weak of heart generally, but Andy's earnestness and empathy makes the viewer feel the sense of something being just so deeply wrong. This isn't your typical textbook TV tragedy. It really helps give off this feeling that this is a real life that has been taken from us. And finally, there's the reveal. Hayward and Truman flip the body over, pull away the plastic to reveal that it's the local homecoming queen herself, Laura Palmer. Note the film language. How a person's body is framed in a shot suggests a lot about the values of a film or TV show and how we're supposed to feel about the character. Shots indicative of the male gaze of women who aren't dead typically involve a framing of body first, then face, to suggest to the viewer a sense of sexual or romantic excitement that the main character has. The camera is checking her out to suggest that she's an object of serious desire for the protagonist. Meanwhile, shots of dead bodies tend to either emphasize the feeling that the main character would have for seeing the body, or emphasize the identity of the character who is dead. So on one extreme end, we might see a dead woman in tattered clothes with a silly or maimed face to then have the camera zoom in rapidly to reveal to us and to the character that someone is dead. This would emphasize the fear of the living character rather than the identity of the dead character. On the other extreme end, we might see an autopsy room where the first thing we see is the character's face, to immediately emphasize who it is that's dead. One instance deliberately heightens the drama of the act of killing, while one deliberately downplays the role of the murder and emphasizes the humanity or identity of the victim. Laura's reveal builds up to the reveal of her face. Before her face is revealed, the characters don't know who it is. Laura being deprived of her identity is indicative of the brutality of her murder, and of murder generally. She has been fully dehumanized. She is literally nothing but an object now. So much so that she isn't yet identifiably Laura, and with the plastic covering her corpse, is barely identifiably human. Truman and Dr. Hayward flipping Laura's body over shows just how lifeless the body has become, just how little humanity is left. It's degrading to watch. It gives this feeling that whoever this is, they're not a human being any. Then her face gets revealed, and we see the once beautiful girl, Laura Palmer, now lifeless. Finding out it's her simultaneously restores some of her humanity, but also calls attention to just how much her murder dehumanized her in the first place. We first see her as an object, then as a subject, just like is typical in films and TV portraying women, but it's her objectification that is seen as a great, horrible tragedy. After all, her murder is the ultimate dehumanization, turning her purely into object, and it's the nature of her dead body as an object that is what drives the unsettling aspects of this scene. There's a deep unpleasantness to it that goes beyond what TV is often willing to portray in order to emphasize the unpleasant nature of her death. 
Much like Blue Velvet before this, Twin Peaks has a thing or two to say about the objectification and dehumanization of women. I'll cover this in more detail in a later section. Laura's death ultimately reveals to us so many things about the world of Twin Peaks. The tragedy of it all is really emphasized by the whole pilot episode. It serves as a nice counterpoint to a lot of television because, and if we go back to a show like 21 Jump Street as an example, it's typical to have the crime of the week foundation for a show like this, where mystery is quickly set up in a very efficient manner and then quickly resolved. Shows rarely ask you to care about the victim of a crime for longer than the 40 minutes it takes to either resolve the issue or create some kind of moral message. Shows, at least at the time, rarely ask you to care about who the person was under the covers on the autopsy table beyond the mystery of who put them there. The pilot episode of Twin Peaks instead really makes it vital that Laura was a human being and shows it through the framing of her death and the gradual reaction of the town. We see Sarah, Leland, Donna, James, and Bobby all become seriously impacted by Laura's death all in a single episode. The school announces the death and everyone feels her death reverberate through the town. This simultaneously gives a lot of weight to who Laura was and to her humanity as a character and also shows how closely knit the social web of the town is, how well everyone knows each other, and how emotionally intimate they are with one another or with Laura specifically. Most importantly, the pilot showcases that a death has an effect, that Laura is not just a body or a victim, but a daughter, a friend, a student, a girlfriend, a member of a community, and now she's gone. And the show lets it sink in because she matters, and she matters because every life matters in some way or another. One of Lynch's major themes in his work is that every life matters, but choosing to do good or let evil corrupt you is the turning point. It's the moral crossroads between allowing your own life to matter or not. In Lynch's work, evil people tend to die because evil people have allowed their life to become meaningless. I'll discuss this in the context of existentialism in a later section, but it's important to know for now that only choosing to do bad things and be a bad person is what can render a life meaningless. You have to allow your life to not matter in order for it to not. Because of a relatively simplistic moral framework in Lynch's work, which isn't a bad thing, it's clear through the pilot that Laura got at least a bit of a redemption after her death. Her life is lost, but her memory will always last and she will be loved even if she's not around. Her death will reverberate forever. It's a bit Christian-like in a sense, but Lynch approaches it in his own particular Lynchy way. So Lynch starts the series out with immediately indicating that Laura, as a person, as a member of a community, as a human being, matters. The show can then spend the rest of its run up until the killer reveal showing why she matters. Before then, however, we ought to discuss the town she's a part of. Twin Peaks, as a town, exists as an ideal, living out in the real world. The cherry pies, the damn fine coffee, the long skirts and cops who actually care about their citizens. This is all an ideal that is, for many, worth striving for. But much like in Blue Velvet, it's a facade that covers up a darkness underneath. The darkness of Twin Peaks is three things simultaneously. It's spiritual, it's interpersonal, and it's political. All three are not incidental to each other. They all inform one another and are three ways of looking at the same dark. The most self-evident way of reading the darkness of Twin Peaks is the spiritual element, so I'll discuss that one first. Sheriff Truman discusses the darkness of the town in episode 3. He says, There's a sort of evil out there. Something very, very strange in these old woods. Call it what you want. Uh, a darkness, a presence. It takes many forms. But it's been out there for as long as anyone can remember. And we've always been here to fight it. This statement summarizes a lot of the spiritual evils of the town rather well. The log lady elaborates on these evils in Fire Walk With Me when she says, when this kind of fire starts, it is very hard to put out. The tender boughs of innocence burn first, and the wind rises, and then all goodness is in jeopardy. Quotes like these, among others, are the characters acknowledging a dark presence that is rarely commented upon. It becomes apparent from the way that characters discuss this spiritual darkness that the town is plagued. Not just by apparitions and, and entities like Bob, but by something else. Something that sings through the trees. Bob is an easy culprit, an easy singular thing to point to, but it's much more than that. The darkness extends much further. Twin Peaks, in my opinion, continues in the tradition of cross-referencing between the works of Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch. Twin Peaks, I think, particularly lifts ideas from The Shining, and one example of this is the similarities between Bob and the woman from Moon 237. 
The woman from room 237 is real, but also isn't real. What's important isn't whether or not she's a ghost or just a symbol, but how Wendy responds to her. First, we see Danny having been strangled by someone, and Wendy immediately believes it to be Jack. Then, Wendy changes narratives and says to Jack that Danny says there's a crazy lady in room 237 that strangled him. Regardless of if there are ghosts in the film, the characters have no reason so far to believe that there are ghosts or supernatural entities, so Wendy's willingness to go along with Danny suggests that she'd rather believe that some unbelievable circumstances, such as a woman hiding in a hotel to then choke Danny quite a while into isolation in this hotel, is responsible for Danny's trauma, rather than it simply being Jack. The woman in room 237 is an easier thing to believe for Wendy than that her husband is a real abuser, even though the latter is more logical. Because Wendy can't face the reality that Jack is the issue, because there's a part of her that loves him too much to recognize him as an abuser. Bob functions much the same way in the narrative of Twin Peaks, in that the great dangers of the town of Twin Peaks aren't only that of the apparition known as Bob. The characters are never able to confirm that Bob is real until the finale of season 2, and even then it's still a bit ambiguous. But their willingness to believe that it was a demon that killed Laura rather than an actual member of their town shows the kind of willful ignorance that is necessary in order to be able to live with the darkness in one's own life. Basically what I'm saying is that the spiritual darkness that befalls the town of Twin Peaks isn't just Bob, and Harry kind of makes it sound like people in the town kind of know this fact, but Bob becomes an easy thing to believe in as a way of ignoring the serious spiritual problems in the town. Firewalk with me undermines the role of Bob in this process and makes the case that, regardless of any spiritual element, it truly is Leland, a human being and member of the town that is responsible for such a brutal act of murder. I'll elaborate more on the role of the spirituality of the film in a separate section, but I just want to start by saying that it's the way that people react to the supernatural occurrences in the show that become important. This is why some of the later stuff, after Lynch left, is so ham-fisted and awkward, because as much as they might influence a feeling of mystery, what they fail to do is capture the visceral emotions that one might feel when faced with something unknown or even unknowable. Now let's discuss the interpersonal angle to the darkness underlying Twin Peaks. As we all know eventually, Leland Palmer is the person who killed Laura Palmer. He also killed Teresa Banks and proceeds to kill Maddie Ferguson. Leland is, canonically, possessed by Bob, but this never quite implies necessarily that Leland isn't responsible for the murders, or that he didn't enjoy doing them. As I said in my previous video, Frank Booth is a literal evil that is similar in nature to a character like Bob, but isn't a spiritual entity. Frank still represents the counterpoint to goodness in people. Dorothy, Sandy, and Jeffrey are examples of goodness in people, but Jeffrey is put at a crossroads between letting the dark influences of the world let him become like Frank, and letting goodness in his heart work against Frank and defy him. Bob presents a similar crossroads to the citizens of Twin Peaks, the crossroads between the darkness and the light of the town. If we look at the bad people of the town, we see characters like Bobby, Hank, Ben, and of course, Leland. Only one of them is possessed by Bob, but all of them showcase the effects of the dark underbelly of Twin Peaks as a- but much like Blue Velvet, there was only f one Frank Booth. That doesn't mean Ben and his other cohorts weren't also corrupt individuals. One need not be the most evil ever to have darkness inside yourself. And that's important to understanding Bob and Leland as characters. Leland let evilness corrupt his very soul. There is still time, there's still a chance for people like Bobby, Hank, and even Ben to ex an extent to become good. The evilness within them has not utterly rotted their soul. There is still even a chance for maybe Leo, but they all have let varying degrees of evil into their hearts. It's important to note that even in Blue Velvet, Jeffrey too had a bit of darkness within him. The point of Blue Velvet isn't that there is a simple distinction between good and bad people, but that the distinction has to be made by yourself to decide whether you are going to do good or do evil. Jeffrey was given the opportunity to exploit a beautiful woman for sexual favors and personal gain. Empathy and compassion led to him turning away from that opportunity and trying to work to save that woman from her being exploited by others. You can choose to do good or to do evil. You can redeem yourself from evil or fall away from good. This is not as simple as you're born good or bad or your past determines your worth here and now. Twin Peaks makes this case time and time again, with redemption arcs for Ben and Bobby, falling from grace arcs for Dale and to an extent Hank, and stories where characters have the chance to become evil and turn away from it, in the case of James, Donna, and most importantly, Laura herself. Very few people in Twin Peaks are simply good or simply bad. Bob is simply bad. Bob is the evilness in everyone, but he becomes concentrated in those he possesses. This is not to say that Bob is the reason why Leland becomes evil. 
Leland is. Leland becomes evil because Leland sees an opportunity to exploit people in his life and he takes it gleefully because he thinks only of himself. This is given much more substance in Fire Walk With Me, but even in the original series, it's clear that Leland has a jealousy streak and a desire to control women for his own purposes. Looking at Maddie's death, for example, notice the motivation. It's not really Bob, is it? It's Leland. Leland misses Laura and wants Maddie to fill that gap in his life because he's a weird narcissist that wants someone to have complete control over. The revelation that Maddie can just leave him fills him with a seemingly jealous rage, the final result of which is a brutal murder. I'd love to expand upon the scene with Maddie later, but the important part is that Leland's evil is not simply v possession, but an interpersonal sense of entitlement, jealousy, and rage. Leland has given himself completely to the evils of the town. He has no investment in seeing the world become a better place, but is instead only motivated by his selfish desires. This is why Bob possesses him. Not because it creates a selfish motive, but because Leland creates it and attracts Bob to become a part of him. If Bob is an apparition to signify the complete giving in to selfish, cruel motivations, just as Frank Booth had done before, then Leland is the one being selfish and being cruel, not Bob. This, of course, contradicts a little with the episode where Leland dies, but I don't think that this contradicts the point I'm making. Rather, I think the creators of the show that weren't lynched were more interested in the moment of the great tragedy rather than focusing so much on the moral messaging of the series. When Bob leaves Leland, it is a great moment, and I don't think it was poorly written, but it was written with the mindset of a good TV show and not so much a morality tale. That is to say, the scene works as a story beat, but fails to understand the point that it seems like Lynch was trying to make with Bob and with Leland, which are much better expressed in Fire Walk With Me. One need not look at Bob to understand the series interpersonal darkness that underlies Twin Peaks. We can look instead to, for example, Hank and Norma. Norma is bound to Hank, a man who involves himself in hit jobs and drug rings, and appears to have his fingers in the pots of a lot of bad goings on in the town of Twin Peaks. Norma is stuck with a particular moral dilemma. Does she remain faithful to Hank, even despite his bad past, thus living by her social duties as a wife but also becoming at least a bit complicit in his evils? Or does she run away with Ed, a much better man, thus failing her duties as a wife but escaping from a man who doesn't treat her right? The kind of moral dilemma that Norma faces is almost a bit of an inverse of the kind that Jeffrey faced in Blue Velvet, a woman choosing between her own role when faced with the different kinds of men in her life. The two sides of the town, the dark and the light, are sides that each character has to contend with in their own right. Let's run down at least a few other examples, but instead of pointing to specific people, let's point to moral dilemmas that several characters have to face and then elaborate from there. First, there's faithfulness versus happiness. James, Donna, Maddie, Ed, Norma, Bobby, Shelley, Ben, Catherine, and possibly Eileen Hayward all are faced with affairs, and their choices when it comes to these things say a lot about their ability to resist or alternatively give in to the darkness of the town. James, Donna, and Maddie form a love triangle that is motivated by a combination of grief over Laura's death, teenage confusion, and a general void in their lives that is filled by the mystery over Laura's killer. All three eventually decide to do the right thing, but not before the dark side of the town gets the best of them for a little while, and they start to show a dark streak each, most notably Donna. Ed and Norma both do the right thing by deciding to remain faithful, but the faithfulness isn't necessarily about Norma's role as a wife. It's more about Ed's role as a husband. Despite being very unhappy with Nadine, Nadine isn't a bad person. She hasn't done anything to hurt Ed, and she loves him. So Ed is trying to do the right thing by keeping Norma at a distance. He wants to be happy, and in season 3 we eventually see this payoff, and it's absolutely glorious. But in the original series, his doing the right thing is what keeps him good in an otherwise rather cruel town. Ben and Catherine are the best other example, because unlike the other characters mentioned, there is a strict demonstration of faithlessness from both of them. Catherine isn't being faithful to Pete, and Ben isn't being faithful to his wife Sylvia. These two eventually have their lives somewhat ruined by their cruelness, which results in Ben going insane in season 2, and then having a weird redemption arc, which I think Lynch didn't really like given how he undoes it in the finale. Catherine is forced to disappear, and later, she becomes involved in further scheming with Josie's husband, Andrew Packard, and some other guy named Thomas. At this point in the series, Lynch had left, and the plot becomes a bit weird, but Lynch corrects that plotline at the end of season 2 by having Andrew and, of all people, Pete, killed. While affairs are bad, the ultimate culmination of disregarding loved ones for personal gain in the original show is Ben's attempted rape of his own daughter, Audrey. I mean, that's what it is. Ben is trafficking underage girls, which we'll get to, and Audrey ends up being one of the girls being trafficked. 
Audrey makes it out okay, but not before an encounter with Ben, who is reaping the benefits of his own empire. Ben is being faithless, abusive, and predatory all at the same time, and it results in him almost seriously harming his own daughter. It's worth noting that this all happens in an episode co-written and directed by Lynch himself. Lynch's tendency towards blunt displays of moral outcome is present here. Ben's own failures as a man, as a husband, and a father culminate in a display of serious attempts at abuse that stem from the empire he's built. Audrey, of course, is caught in the line of fire of Ben's own cruelty, but she eventually escapes and her life turns for the better, at least during the time. Another moral dilemma that a lot of people are facing is to be complicit or stand against the bad deeds of the town. This is presented by characters like Laura, Dr. Jacoby, Harold, and Sarah, all of whom know about evil goings-on, especially in Laura's life but in general, and have to choose between speaking up or not. Confidentiality and his own affection for Laura is what leads Jacoby towards being complicit. Sarah's fear of Leland silences her, while agoraphobia and a similar affection for Laura prevents Harold from speaking out. None of these people killed Laura, but they are all part of the web of issues in the town that allowed her to die. A third moral dilemma is to stay in the underbelly of the town or leave. Bobby, Ben, Jerry, Leland, most of the more villainous characters of the show always always have an opportunity to get out of that life and be better people. We see this with Philip Gerard as a nice symbol of redemption and what it may cost. So all of this is to say, the darkness of Twin Peaks is not meant to be purely spiritual, but to reflect a serious dysfunction in the culture of the town. The town has serious moral interpersonal issues, and these two contribute to the darkness, the evil out there in the woods. Laura's death was not just the result of demonic possession, but of a town that is unwell.